Good evening and welcome to the Kansas Legislature on Smoky Hill Public Television. I'm your host, Mike Walker. I'm from the Docking Institute of Public Affairs at Fort Hay State University. Fort Hay State University, the home of the tigers and many raccoons. <laughs> <laughs> With me tonight, I have four uh, members of the legislature. I have two representatives and two senators. We'll start introductions on my far right with Representative Don Heinemann. Don is from District 118 in uh, the town of Dighton. On my far left, Representative Russ Jennings, District 122 and from the town of Lincoln. Uh, on my near right is Senator Randall Hardy from District 24 and he's from Salina. And on my left is Senator Leonard Mastroni, <laughs> District 117 from La Crosse. This, I want to remind viewers that this is a call-in show, so we'd like to remind you to call in 1-800-337-4788. This, this show offers uh, folks an opportunity to speak to their representatives, so it's very important for you to call in and ask questions. Uh, I have a few uh, items I'd like to discuss, but why don't we go ahead around the table in the same order? So we'll start with Don. Um, uh, can you give us an idea of what, uh, I, I noticed that you're on the rural, you're the chair of the Rural Revitalization Committee. Anything going on that committee at the moment? Yes, I am chair of the new committee called Rural Revitalization. Uh, it was established by Speaker Ron Reichman and he asked me to chair it and uh, um, I'm really pleased to have that position. It's uh, of urgent interest, I think, to the entire state and the fact that uh, the speaker created this committee and made it a five day a week committee wow. indicates that uh, he thinks it's pretty important. Um, it, so, you know, there's so many aspects of rural revitalization that we can be looking at and, and we've been digging through a lot of material uh, since early January. Representative Jennings is on the committee with me. Um, so right now we're just trying to flesh out the challenges that faced rural Kansas before we get into trying to address uh, what possible action points we can find to make things better for people who live in rural. Very good. Okay, thank you. All right, Representative Jennings, so you're the chair of the Corrections and Juvenile Justice Committee. I have some questions about some of the bills that have been going through, but maybe you'll go ahead and just give us an idea of what uh, the committee is working on? Sure. Well, I've been chair of the committee. This would be my uh, second term as chair, so I'm in my third year of that. Uh, we primarily focus on matters relating to criminal law, the uh, Department of Corrections operations and programs, and juvenile justice as well. So uh, we address anything that amounts to uh, crimes, punishments, or procedure under the criminal code and the corrections system. Very good. Thanks. Senator Hardy, I know, you, you all are members of more committees, but I, I know you're the vice chair of the Ethics, Elections, and Local Government Committee. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, anything going on in the committee right now? Well, uh, we've, we've had uh, primarily uh, informational kinds of, of hearings, uh, but uh, the, the work that we're doing on bills is going to pick up considerably uh, next week. Uh, we're going to be uh, talking uh, about one bill I think is going to be interesting. It's called Same Day Voter Registration, oh, yes. which will allow people that, primarily people that have uh, uh, filled out a provisional ballot to have it counted. Uh, there are a lot of uh, provisional ballots that are left hanging because people are not registered to vote I when see. they submit them, and, uh, and this will allow that uh, process to happen. So. That's, Fantastic. that's one bill that's right. going through. Well, Senator Mastroni, can you wait a minute? We have a caller, and I'll sure. get back to you. Sure. All right, we have a caller, Carol from El Dorado. Go oh, ahead, please. Thanks, El Dorado. <clears throat> Are you there? Yes, please. Go ahead. Yes. Um, a few years ago, you know, you changed the second half of our property tax being due on May the 10th instead of June the 20th which really didn't help us, the ones that you were supposed to be working for. But why can't you, since you can do that on our second half of the, where the property taxes is due, uh, in December uh, the 20th is when the first half is due, why can't you make that the 28th? So those of us that are on Social Security that doesn't get our check until uh, the fourth Wednesday of the month, 
that way we can have December to pay our taxes instead of having to try to come up with the money in November. Okay, that's a fantastic question. Thank you. I, I think I got most of it. It was a, kind of breaking up a bit, but uh, I believe there was a question about instead of having taxes due on the 20th, push it to the 28th. Is that well, it, it really is pretty poor timing right now. It's, it's an unwelcome Christmas gift for folks that they have to pay property taxes just a few days before Christmas. Um, I don't know what impediments might be in our way to back it up to December 28th. I think we ought to look at it. I think that's a reasonable suggestion. I appreciate it. Anything else? Anyone have, want to add to that? Anyone else? Is that pretty good? Uh, oh, we have another uh, caller. Thank you for calling in. Jack, go ahead, please. Okay. Jack, thanks for calling. Go ahead and uh, ask your question, please. Nope, not there. All right, we'll move back on. Uh, Representative Mastroni, uh, Social Services Budget Vice Chair. Do you have anything you uh, want to report on that committee work? I do. Um, <clears throat> we've been busy here with a lot of information type hearings uh, from the various agencies in the state. And over the last couple of days, we've actually started working some of the budgets with uh, Parsons State Hospital. and. Uh, and then we've also uh, are taking a hard look at uh, Larned State Hospital as well because of a lot of the employee vacancies that we have down there right now. Very good. All right. Thank you. Okay. I think we might have Jack on the line. Jack, go ahead, please. <laughs> and I guess we don't have Jack on the line. Okay. <laughs> well, there's a few issues that seem to come up often on these shows, and I think I'll uh, highlight those. But if there's other issues that you want to discuss, that's uh, perfectly fine. Well, school finance is always in the news. Um, I don't know if some of those bills are going through your committees or whatnot, but I, I assume you'll be, you are discussing school finance and you'll be involved at some point. Do you want to discuss the school finance issue for a, a bit? Any, any activity going on uh, this week? The, the Senate has uh, been uh, debating a big tax bill and, and also the big uh, CAPERS bill payment bill. And uh, we've been uh, keeping um, uh, school finance on the back burner until okay. then. Uh, the House may be <coughs> farther along than we are with that. I, I do know that uh, hearings have started, though, on Senate okay. committees. Okay. But let's uh, dive right into the, the CAPERS uh, issue that you mentioned. Uh, that was mm -hmm. something I was going to address later on. Uh, what happened this week on that issue? Well, the uh, Senate voted 40-0 uh, uh, to make a payment of $115 million uh, to the CAPERS fund to, uh, in an effort to move the, the, uh, the fund to being uh, fully, what's the, what's the term that we should, that we, that we call it's it? I mind. think it's current payment, probably well, to make up some payments that we missed. Right. We're, we're, we were behind uh, in um, the, the payments to CAPERS, and, and this is an effort to catch up and to and get it um, on, on track. Okay. Okay. That's what I uh, Is that Jerry from Garden City? That's true. All right. Go ahead, please. Uh, good afternoon, guys. I um, was really uh, wondering how we're going to do on judicial compensation. Hmm. I didn't quite catch up. Okay. Judicial, judicial compensation. Uh, judicial compensation. Oh, that's, uh, that's a good question, Jerry. We uh, had some conversations last year on judicial compensation. Our judges in the state uh, rank last in the nation in terms of compensation for district judges. Uh, there's been money put in by the Supreme Court to uh, raise those uh, salaries by, uh, I believe it's about 10% a year over the next two years, and uh, try to get them to uh, kind of midstream. That would only bring them up to a 35th or 36th place in the nation in terms of compensation. So uh, as is the case with many employees of the state or officers of the state, the last decade has resulted in us really falling behind in terms of our uh, salary rates for uh, folks, and this is one area that's become quite a critical need. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Exactly, and uh, you can add that, uh, add magistrate judges to that list as well. Um, we, 
it's, uh, it's sad when we're not able to pay um, people that, um, you know, good thing, do good work for the state of Kansas and we're not able to pay them a competitive wage. I might add that last uh, year we gave a raise to the non-judicial employees and many of them were having to work part-time jobs just to uh, support their families mm -hmm. and uh, uh, they have gotten a raise but the judges uh, forego theirs so we could, uh, uh, so the non-judicial people could have a raise. Okay. So now we're making it up on the judge side, it sounds like. <clears throat> That's correct. Okay, we have another caller. Vernon from Alden. Go ahead, please. Nope. All right. Vernon, call back if you can. Um, I didn't want to cut anybody off. Did we? Yeah, are we good? Okay. All right. Let's go. Uh, go ahead. I'll follow up on <laughs> okay. the judicial pay thing. Uh, you know, it's a it's a symptom of the fact that for several years now the state has had an imbalance between revenues and necessary expenditures to adequately fund mm -hmm. government. We're behind the curve on judicial pay, uh, but that's true in a number of, of other state agencies where mm -hmm. there are pent up needs within the agencies that need to be met. Um, and all of this comes at a time when we have a Supreme Court order to increase school funding. Um, we have a new transportation plan that's coming together that will, will require additional funding. And our obligation to CAPERS continues to go up from year to year. Um, so meeting all of those needs uh, in the short term is going to be very, very difficult, if not impossible. Right. It'll be a matter of prioritizing, and some things won't get done. Yeah, that's right. Okay, we have another caller, Nick from Victoria. Yes, uh, I noticed you guys have kind of been talking about some budgetary issues, and uh, particularly on the Senate side, what I don't understand is the bill that you recently passed about the uh, windfall deal that they've been talking about, you know, you guys have been talking about all these needs that are statewide, all these agencies. How can you responsibly talk about decreasing the revenue when it's available when there's all these serious needs that need to be addressed? I just don't understand how that all, you know, works together. Okay, thank you. I guess I should address that one. <laughs> well, Senate Bill 22 is uh, the bill that you were referring to. And uh, that bill, I, I think you would find if you asked uh, individual senators that uh, every senator probably had issues with at least portions of the bill. And uh, I, the, the portion of the bill that I felt like needed to be addressed was the um, itemized deductions for individuals. The rest of the, the bill really didn't appeal to me. And uh, I, in an effort to um, get, keep the bill uh, moving to the House, I was hoping that, uh, that, we, that the House could perhaps uh, have uh, maybe perhaps a different discussion about uh, the, the tax situation, that we could separate out some of those items, uh, consider them individually, and, and not necessarily uh, pass a whole package, which does have a hefty price tag attached to it. And I agree with you uh, that it, at, at this particular time, I was not in favor of um, debating such a large bill. I thought that it was more prudent uh, to have a, a better handle on the entire budget situation before we uh, debated the tax bill, but that was, uh, that was the, the hand that we were dealt. So we left the Senate, now it goes to the House for their uh, debate? And right, well the same process will start over in the House. Okay. The, the House uh, Tax Committee will, will get the bill and then they can do it, whatever they want to with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, if they change one syllable, uh, then it's going to require another vote in the, in the Senate uh, in order to have it go to the governor. I have a feeling uh, that the, the House uh, looks at things a little differently than, mm -hmm. the, than the Senate does. And I'm, I'm thinking uh, that between the two bodies it will come up with something that uh, works for everybody. Okay, very good, thank you. You know, and, and, and to this question, and it, it really gets to the larger issue, just a, a couple of years ago, we had to override the governor's veto in order to roll back very significant tax cuts that went very deep and caused 
economic chaos for the state's budget. And when we did the override of the governor's veto on that tax bill, the average tax rate for Kansans and businesses in Kansans uh, in Kansas was still 15% below where it was prior to the Brownback tax plan being right. imposed. So it's not as if Kansans have been without any tax reduction from the state in recent years. Mm -hmm. What's occurred here is one that often is spoken of about fairness. Is it fair for a cohort of people to end up having a, a modest tax increase? The top tax increase for anyone would be roughly $500 in the year's time. Mm -hmm. And that anyone is likely to be among the highest earners uh, in the state because you have to penetrate above $12,500 of itemized uh, deductions in order to fall into the new segment that's between the twelve five dollars and the 24000 to right. be eligible to itemize in Kansas. Correct. This is complex stuff. Mm -hmm. The rhetoric that goes out there, the talking points go out there, focus on one or two items, and there's a much broader story to tell. Capers payment, Mm -hmm. uh, PMIB pool, uh, pooled investment uh, money uh, that we borrowed. Uh, we've got school finance to take care of. And I think before anything happens, every legislator really will have to sit down and make that priority list. What's number one? Okay. And, then, and then go from there. I think Chairman Waymaster on appropriations has a huge challenge ahead of him in trying to balance a budget <laughs> if all of the revenue streams are choked off or spending decisions are made one at a time. I got you. Very good. I think the thing that's messed in this, the, the reason that Senate Bill 22 is, is deemed to be necessary by some, is the fact that the federal uh, government cut income taxes at the federal level a year ago, and, and through a couple of quirks that had the effect of increasing state taxes for some individuals and some very large corporations with overseas investments. Okay. Um, but if you stand back and look at it as a whole, I think it's, I'm safe in saying that everyone, every individual and every corporation, even if nothing is done uh, with something like Senate Bill 22, everyone will have a lower total tax bill this year than they had a year ago. Hmm. Um, so it's, yeah, it's a matter of, of fairness. Those individuals who are caught in that situation will possibly pay more than, than they would have if we don't fix this. Um, but another narrative that's missed is that most of the benefit will go to those large multinational corporations mm -hmm. and not individuals. So um, I think that's a consideration we'll, we'll have in the, in the House as well. Um, we will we will take our time with that bill and consider all aspects. I think okay. there'll be broader tax discussions. We will have a conversation about sales tax on food. Mm -hmm. We will have a conversation about property taxes, which continue to escalate. And are there opportunities to mitigate those in some way? Um, but I, it's really strikes me as being time to just step back a moment and look at that entire structure, and try to assure that we achieve balance and that there are sufficient resources to meet the needs of the state. Not the desires, the needs. These right. are needs at this point. There's no fat left on the, yeah. on the <laughs> bone here. Ann, are you still on the line? Ann, if you're there, go ahead, please. I, I don't have anything really as pressing as taxes and budgetary issues, but I would like the legislature to consider do, doing away with daylight saving time. Ah, okay. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Any discussion on daylight savings time? Uh, you know, the, uh, on, the, on the surface, it, it sounds pretty simple. Uh, but uh, if you go to the eastern part of the state, unless you had every state around Kansas doing the same thing, you would have uh, a challenge in Kansas City, partic in particular. I see. Uh, right. Whether you're, uh, you know, when the, the line goes right up the middle of the city, right. uh, it would proved to be quite confusing, I, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. Think about families with children and school starting at one time in their home community and they have to be to work in a different time zone. It complicates things for people's lives and particularly in the urban areas. I don't know that it mattered to us out here, but certainly uh, on, a, on a state line break, that would be a problem. When I was in the Army, I served at uh, Fort Benning, Georgia, but I lived in Phoenix City, Alabama, and there was an hour difference between the two. <laughs> it was, uh, okay. Vernon, uh, I hope you're on the line again. Vernon from Alden. Good evening, gentlemen. Hello. Uh, my uh, 
uh, I'm just an, uh, an old country boy lawyer. And I uh, have a question. Uh, how do you plan to have a balanced budget when the uh, <laughs> Supreme Court, all political appointees, not elected by the people, keep telling you how much money to spend, public money, for public education. And I would appreciate your answer. Okay, thank you very much. Who wants to jump into that one? <laughs> well, I'm, I will. I, I, sure, it, go ahead. This is, uh, and, and Vernon, if, if you are in fact an old country lawyer, you understand that the Constitution of the state of Kansas makes certain provisions for public education and that the Supreme Court of the state of Kansas is the court of last resort to resolve those constitutional questions. The court has not prescribed a specific dollar amount, although they got very close to that in this last decision after we made significant progress, but they've told us time and again that we were either uh, inadequately funded or there was a lack of equity in taxation and distribution of funds. We've met the equity piece. We're $90 million short uh, of, of meeting what I believe the court and the plaintiffs in this case will accept, and that will achieve a cost of living increase approach to the last time uh, funding was found to be constitutional. I, I believe in my mind it is the cheapest and most direct route out of the cycle of uh, litigation. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. And my only thought is that uh, if there was no lawsuit, if the, if the government, if the, the legislature was adequately funding uh, schools, there would be no lawsuit. And if there's no lawsuit, mm -hmm. there's no Supreme Court. Right, well, yes. and then the correlating argument that comes along with this is a constitutional amendment to take that kind of power away from the courts. <laughs> And I can tell you that if you are living in a rural area of the state of Kansas, you would be entrusting legislators from Sedgwick County and Johnson County to decide how much rural schools would be funded. And I think that uh, we might find out rather quickly that they're more concerned with their schools than ours, and by the way, they outnumber us significantly in the legislature. So that constitutional protection, I think, is particularly important in, in rural districts. It is a, a quandary because the legislature is constitutionally authorized to be the appropriators. We're the ones who say how the money is spent. And yet I agree with Representative Jennings, if we don't have that constitutional protection that we get by judicial oversight, eventually school children in rural Kansas will be left behind. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, Carol, uh, you're on the line. Go ahead, please. On the line. <laughs> yeah, I called a while ago. Um, when we had Brown back as governor, he done away with the uh, food sales tax refund for senior citizens, which cost me like 90 meals because I, at the time I could buy the banquet meals for a dollar a piece. Not, I couldn't get 100 because I got to pay sales tax, you know. Uh, are you ever going to bring that back? Because that does hurt us senior citizens that are just living on Social Security. Okay, thank you. Did, uh, tax refund for senior citizens on does so that it's a food sales tax oh, okay. refund that was available in the past that was in fact uh, removed uh, particularly uh, assisted low-income elderly and disabled folks there were income limitations they could receive a refundable uh, uh, tax amount of I want to say up to ninety dollars was the maximum um, it did go away and in, in, in all of the efforts to try and balance budgets and I would submit to sustain a flawed uh, tax structure that was one of the casualties right along with deductibility of home mortgage and and a number of other things so this is a th these kinds of things should be a part of the conversation and I think I think often um, and I really do appreciate the call you don't necessarily consciously think about folks who are on very limited fixed incomes where that ninety dollars is a significant amount to them, it's food right. on the table. It's food. Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay, thank you, Wayne from Colby. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, I last uh, on January twenty second, 
I was watching the uh, C-SPAN program on television, and it featured Governor Jay Inslee of Washington State, and he was talking with uh, mayors from across the country and mentioned that his state and 16 states total belong to a climate initiative group. It sounds like an exactly the type of thing that Kansas should join, and if uh, if you know anything about it, I'd like to hear your comments. Uh, if you don't, I would recommend that you and other legislators uh, look into the possibility of joining this climate initiative. Okay, thank you. Uh, does anyone know about that issue, the climate and uh, I'm not sure about group. that. You know, the one thing that I think about, though, on my drive out from Salina is the renewable energy um, uh, part of, of what Kansas is all about now. And uh, and I don't know how many people know this, but Kansas is a, next, uh, is a net exporter of uh, electricity. And uh, wind energy itself is, um, in about four years, will be our primary form of uh, generating electricity. Right now it's at about uh, 34 percent, I believe, of the, of the amount of uh, electricity that we generate. So we, we may not be part of that particular program, but I think we are doing some things that uh, are helping um, to be kind to our, our uh, world that we live in. Very good. Okay. All right. Anyone else want to add to that discussion? Or Okay. Alrighty. Um, well, on my list of talking points was Senate Bill 22, but I think we covered that pretty well. Uh, let me go ahead and uh, I know I ran through the I looked at the website tonight, and there's, there's some bills that are making their way through uh, the legislature, and we might have another caller soon. But uh, House Bill 2033, which is providing sales tax authority to Dickinson, Finney, Jackson, Russell, and Thomas counties. It's on the Committee on Taxation. Is there any di discussion on that? I think, bill and was that bill just to extend the, uh, the, the number of years uh, that it could collect that sales tax? I have my notes right here. It's an, <laughs> it's an authorization for cities or counties oh, to yes, yes. have a public vote for establishing a, an incremental increase in their sales tax. That went across the House floor on final action today and passed. Okay. okay. So I guess it's a, it I guess is it a, a procedural a, vote, so okay. the local folks get to vote on whether or not to impose the tax, and we are just like an approval agency for right. some reason. Right. Right. Not sure why we have to do it, <laughs> frankly. If the local people are voting for it, I'm not sure the legislature ought to be meddling in their <laughs> affairs, <laughs> but their, they rule. could vote nevertheless, <laughs> we do. That so. actually did trigger that discussion the past couple of days, that why do we do this? Those initiatives are brought for, forth by city council, county commission. Mm -hmm. They're elected officials in their own right. Why do they have to come to Topeka and ask for permission to put those initiatives on the ballot and ask, ask their own taxpayers for support? Well, they it's become, a, they become yeah. weaponized, too, as a political tool. So Wallace County last year had this very issue in front of the legislature. It was amended into a tax cut bill that was offered in the last days of the legislature last year and that bill failed. So Wallace County's request for approval to do what their voters already said they wanted to do uh, didn't happen didn't and now it's back this year. It's, yeah, it's a, they're used as a tool or leverage in order to make it difficult for, for people to vote against a particular bill because it's embedded within there. So you watch I this see, bill, see. it will not ever be seen again by itself. Right. It will be attached to something else. Okay, we have another caller. Nick from Inman. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for taking my call. Um, a lot of discussion has been going on uh, at the federal level and state level regarding a uh, green leafy substance called the cannabis plant. And last year I know that uh, Senate Bill 282, um, they kind of violated, were federal law by allowing CBD oil sales until the farm bill got passed. So it kind of set a little precedent there. And I'm wondering, um, with everything going the way it is, and we're starting to find out uh, that uh, some of the things that, and the harms and potential harms of this plant has been exaggerated a little bit over the years, 
Uh, I'm wondering the direction that the Kansas legislature, especially the members there, are thinking that we're going to take this and if they would support um, amending uh, current bills to add uh, the constitutionality of home growing for uh, therapeutic cannabis, as it were, or, in fact, uh, just to take it off the State Controlled Substances Act so it can be um, used for uh, whatever purposes a citizen uh, wants to. Okay, thank you. I think there's an appetite in the legislature to take baby steps with regard to that particular species. Mm -hmm. um, there's some interest in medicinal marijuana, and I think that possibly has some viability. Mm -hmm. Actually, the House passed a medical marijuana bill a couple of years ago, and the Senate didn't see fit to follow our lead, <laughs> uh, so maybe that'll happen again. Mm -hmm. um, industrial hemp, we passed a bill last year to allow right. research level uh, production of industrial hemp. Mm -hmm. The new farm bill opens that up to more production level, true uh, commercial production level. Um, we now need to pass another bill to get in sync with the new federal standards. Um, I expect that will happen. But those are baby steps. Recreational marijuana is a different, uh, a different level. Um, and uh, I don't see the legislature going in that direction anytime soon, but um, I guess you can never say never. Anyone else on that issue? We have another caller, but if you, okay, let's go with Douglas from Hayes. Douglas, are you there? Yes, I am. All righty, thank you. Go ahead, please. I'm just wondering when the state of Kansas is going to bring the uh, wage limit up to where a person can actually afford to live on it, because you can't live on seven fifty an hour. Okay, thank you. Okay, minimum wage, raising the minimum wage. This is a, another one of those issues where I, I would like to see something happen on the federal level uh, because um, of uh, competitive uh, natures of, of the surrounding states. And uh, for, for instance, for Kansas to do that uh, and, and would put us perhaps at a competitive disadvantage uh, when, uh, when you get over to Johnson County and some of those uh, border counties. Uh, I, I understand, I, I, and I, I, I'm a free market person by nature, uh, but uh, you know, in Salina, I'll, I'll, I'm cognizant of the, when I see uh, billboards that Brahms is hiring at 11 bucks an hour and Walmart's hiring at $11 an hour. So I, I see little little spurts here and there. And, and unfortunately, we don't have that um, uh, all over yet. But I, I think we're moving uh, in that, I think we're moving in that direction. Um, of course, uh, establishing that by uh, legis a legislature would, would get us moving quicker. Uh, but I, I would prefer that the federal government do that rather than uh, deal with it on a state level. Okay, very good. Anyone else want to jump in on the minimum wage issue or wages in general? Well, I certainly agree. Um, it's better to let the economy respond to market signals and set wages rather than government artificially setting wages. Um, wage and price controls at the federal level or the state level quite often get it wrong and send the wrong signals to the economy and, and you have unintended adverse effects. Um, I don't want to dry up the availability of jobs for folks who are in food service and, and uh, uh, the uh, hotel business, we could do that if we raise the minimum wage too high for the, the hotel owners and the shopkeepers to be able to afford to hire. Okay. Want to add something or should we go for a... You go ahead and okay. I'd like right. to go back to that. Though. Okay, we'll go back to it. Rick from Concordia, go ahead please. Yes, um, I want to know if there's any uh, chance the sales tax on food can be re reduced during this session. Um, as you're, I'm sure you're aware, Kansas is one of the few states that charges the uh, full sales tax on food. Most states do not charge any sales tax on food, and a few states uh, charge a minimal tax um, with some communities in excess of 10% on their sales tax, 
including state and local. Is there any chance that there can be some relief for all Kansas taxpayers with a reduction in the uh, sales tax on food during this session? Thank you. Okay, very good, thanks. This session is gonna happen. Well, on the Senate side, you know, I just hear conversations so far. There is no direct um, uh, legislation in the works, but I think there's some appetite for reducing the sales tax on food by uh, gradually, say a penny a year, something like that, that would be uh, palatable uh, perhaps to the legislature and, and at least start the ball moving in that direction. Okay. I'd also add to that that 1% um, drop in the sales tax is equivalent to $40 million. So um, it is something that we'd have to um, shuffle around to find uh, mm -hmm. revenue from other sources as well. So, wow. All right. uh, Joe from Garden City, go ahead, please. We'll get back to uh, I was under, uh, wanted to talk about the overloads that run up and down 83 uh, trucks and the, and the tax on diesel fuel because if you go through Garden City on the bypass that road is tore up thank you okay you bet thank you well, Joe, that sounds like my district, um, and I can I, I would make a suggestion in terms of overload trucks on 83. Uh, any person who sees a vehicle being operated in what they believe to be an illegal manner ought to contact the Highway Patrol. You can call them at star 47, and they will respond and do and try to do something about what's been observed. On the uh, bypass in Garden City, it is my understanding that there is a project scheduled this year to go ahead and take care of that bypass from Campus Drive back down around to Highway 50. Oh. Uh, it is cratered out and in terrible condition, and we've had very nice winters the last several years. This winter is not being as kind, and that road will deteriorate more quickly. So the bad news is it will get worse before it gets better but they, it will get fixed, that's what I'm told. Okay, uh, Katie from Inman, go ahead please. Hi, yeah, um, in regards to one of your previous callers, um, and he was talking about the criminal justice system, I was just wondering why isn't a positive UA considered recidivism? Positive UA. If you like, I'd be happy to visit about <laughs> this. Go ahead. <laughs> so Nobody those else? who are convicted of criminal offenses are often placed on probation if they're, uh, or parole upon release from prison. As a condition, they may have to take your analysis test to determine whether or not there's an illegal substance. It is a technical violation of the law. It is not a new crime. While they would have had to have committed a new crime, the presence of the substance in and of itself is not a crime. Substance abuse is the leading contributor to criminality in the nation, and we're not exempt here in Kansas. The only way that you deal with substance abuse effectively in the end is to provide treatment. We are having passed out a bill this year out of my committee to enhance treatment opportunities for those suffering from a substance abuse uh, issue uh, and to try to keep them out of prison so that they can be more productive and hopefully successful in the end. Uh, it, it is complicated, and yes, they have failed, but those who are in recovery uh, often fail multiple times before they finally kind of get the message. So um, you don't put them back in prison on the first time they're hot. I see. I see. Anyone else? Do you want to get back to the uh, minimum wage issue, uh, Leonard, that you were? Yes. Um, okay. Then we'll get that. I'd like to uh, just talk a little bit about Larned State Hospital and uh, we had a, the citizens of Pawnee County have come together with a leadership group and they, that leadership group is partnering, partnering with Larned State Hospital and their purpose is to help promote um, employees. Um, currently right now there's about 262 vacancies at Larned State Hospital 
And what we did, as, uh, as I did as a legislator, invited them uh, one day uh, last week, and they brought them in front of the uh, house, and they were able to, uh, um, we made a little presentation and introduced them. And then we let those people uh, from the leadership committee go around and talk to the representatives and talk to them about the issues that we are um, having there. Um, problem is a lot of the people, the employees there are working double shifts and it's uh, very trying on those. So uh, uh, the, the great thing that's coming out of this is the state hospital has developed a um, learnedcares.com site and people that are interested in um, being employed by the state hospital and making career of that can um, contact, uh, go to that website and that goes directly to the human resource office and they can help you with the ap application process. Very good, okay. It's part of a, I think that sort of jumped off from our discussion of wages. Is there some uh, discussion on wages in that uh, right. mix there? Well, the problem is, is a lot of, a lot of our wages at the hospital starting is uh, $14.66 an hour. And that's pretty much competitive, you know, with some of the uh, fast food places and things like that. Oh, and uh, and that is real hard work. Uh, you get a a um, uh, CNA mental health CNA uh, that has to do that kind of hard work, and it's it's very difficult to attract people at that kind of wages. So our budget committee that I am on are trying to do their best to recommend higher wages for the uh, mental health people. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Carol, back on the line from El Dorado? Yes. Uh, I was wondering if there was a way of passing a law to where if anyone runs for Congress, they have to live in our state and not be like Pat Roberts, who lives in Virginia, and uh, Bob Dole, he lived in Florida, Casabom, she lived in Tennessee. I mean, they were pork bellying them states, but they were supposed to be representing us, but they didn't even live here. And, because not last election, but the election before, uh, I didn't realize that Pat Roberts didn't, you know, live here. And they said that all he does is he comes here every six years and rents a room in his country club golf course place. And I called up the election office and asked him, I said, well, is that legal when he only comes here once every six years? And they said, yeah, it is. So is there any way that we can make a law that says that if you're going to be a senator from our state, you have to live in our state? That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I would imagine, I think the law is they have to have residence in the mm. state. Now, mm -hmm. whether or not they spend time here is another issue, but... Sometimes uh, that comes up in the legislature about uh, where, where is this person living or did right. this person move here just to run and run for office right. and that kind of thing as well. So it, it's something that um, has to be dealt with. Uh, you have to, there are certain requirements that you have to meet, whether it's um, a residential address or, or what what have you but um, you know I it's very difficult to you know have the police out there seeing if you're going into your house every night kind of thing so I, I don't know how you would enforce that right okay I guess the election is when we enforce those rules. Right. <laughs> the election is the, is, the, is the place to do that. Well, there's yeah. federal laws that govern federal elections and, and qualifications right. to hold office, and right. state law governs state offices. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure there's anything we could do if we wanted to other than to petition the people who don't live here, apparently. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have another caller. Bill from Atwood. Go ahead, please. Yeah, I uh, maybe haven't listened to everything that uh, you've been talking about, but uh, I wanted to uh, ask what Kansas is doing with this problem of illegal immigration and sanctuary cities, because I noticed Texas has passed some laws, and I wondered what Kansas was doing. Okay, thank you. Well, I don't believe there are any sanctuary cities in Kansas. Uh, uh, from what I know, uh, Salina, anyway, is, um, uh, has a, a, a good system of communication with the federal government and, 
I, I have a feeling, and I, I don't know of particular cases, but uh, that would indicate to me that if there are um, any illegal immigrants, that that communication is, uh, is made to the federal officers in charge. And so I don't, I don't, and I really haven't read about there being an issue in Salina anyway. Okay. Okay. Well, and I, I think, again, this is one of those issues that's primarily a federal issue. Immigration law, enforcement of immigration law is a federal, uh, federal authority. Um, Garden City is in my district. Uh, when you go to Garden City and uh, you go to Walmart on a Saturday, you're going to see any one of 34 to 35, 36 different nationalities represented in that market that are providing labor. I know uh, the major employers that employ these folks go through the steps that they're legally required to go through to verify the individuals eligible to be working there. They're paying taxes. Uh, they're paying state and federal taxes, Social Security. Um, I don't know how much of resource the state would have available to investigate uh, and report. Certainly those illegal immigrants that uh, law enforcement comes across, Homeland Security's notified, Customs Border folks, and they're, mm -hmm. they're sent away right. okay. after they're done serving their prison term in Kansas if they're convicted. Okay. okay. Uh, Adam from Norton, go ahead, please. Good evening. Can you hear me? You sure can. Yep. Go ahead. Okay. I thank you for taking my call. Thanks for having this show. Don't know if any of you are aware of it. We're losing more and more businesses out here in what I call God's country, west of Salina, which means loss of jobs, loss of state income off of the tax. That means we got people buying gas. We don't have the money to fix the roads. Any ideas what the legislature can do to help our small towns retain these businesses out here? Okay, thank you. Well, that's subject matter for my committee that I chair, Rural Revitalization. And we're looking at all those, the different factors that affect rural Kansas. And you're right, we're losing population, we're losing jobs. That means less economic activity, that means uh, less viability for the grocery store and the drug store on Main Street. It, it's a real problem and, and it's multifaceted. We have identified two factors that we think we need to address, and they're both very difficult and likely to be expensive, but universal access to high-speed broadband is absolutely essential to rural Kansas. It's essential for, um, for me medical care delivery, it's essential for education, it's essential for just commerce in general. Um, what business doesn't already interact with the internet? Internet, and we know that's going to grow as time goes on. Um, and if you want to recruit young people back to rural Kansas, you absolutely have to have high-speed broadband, or they're not interested in coming. So we have to address that because we know we have deficient areas throughout the state, and we're going to work on that. Mm -hmm. The other issue is affordable housing. That's also a universal issue, I think, in every small town in Kansas. We're at full employment right now. The unemployment rate in many Kansas communities is two or three percent. Anyone that wants a job in Kansas has a job right now. And we have businesses that would like to expand. And they can't expand because they can't find workers. And they, they workers aren't there because they can't find a place to live. Uh, that also is a very difficult puzzle to solve, but we want to find ways to address that and make it better and, and hopefully relieve the pressure and um, let some economic activity grow in rural Kansas. Yeah. You know, I'm on the, I serve on the Utilities Committee in the Senate and uh, we have uh, just had uh, informational hearings on something called 5G technology and uh, I do know that AT&T is beginning to deploy networks uh, in, across west, western Kansas, the first town that is being um, uh, used as uh, liberal. And uh, small cell technology has little uh, poles all over, the, all over town to maximize uh, the bandwidth. And this is the kind of technology that uh, will uh, be a game changer, I think, in the cities where it's deployed where you can download a movie in two minutes, that kind of thing. So I, I, I'm hopeful that uh, 
uh, that 5G will take hold and that the major carriers will start uh, deploying that uh, throughout the, the western part of the state. All righty. And I think one of the things that came up in our revitalization committee meeting in the last week or two that really struck me was a fellow by the name of Terry Woodbury who spoke about the need for communities from the ground up uh, to help themselves, that it's a local solution. If you're waiting for the state or the federal government to help with depopulation of rural Kansas, it won't happen. It's going to happen in your community. Greeley County, Tribune is a great example of a community that 25 years ago looked as if it was on the path to extinction and they now have a vibrant downtown uh, with I think almost every building filled and uh, they're looking for more opportunities for growth and they've done a nice job but, but they did it for themselves. They had some help and support but no one can do this for you. Every community's got to be responsible for itself first. We have Brian from Mineola. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, uh, thank you for taking my call. Uh, we, I'm a contractor in, in western Kansas, and uh, we've experienced some problems with uh, Wells Fargo and the banking system and, and their you know, accounts going down. I just wondered how you guys felt about, uh, about Bitcoin, uh, like coin cryptocurrencies, and if you how you see the future of that integrating in with our financial system. Okay, thank you. Any question about Bitcoin? I or, haven't or heard, other I haven't heard of um, much noise around Topeka and the State House, uh, at any rate, about Bitcoin. I do know that it's, it's something that's, it's pro it still sounds like it's in its infancy, and uh, in order to be more widely accepted and and utilized, uh, there's going to be quite an educational process, and uh, and and it, it'll it's it'll have to grow to a, a stage of maturity before uh, it would be of much use to us in Kansas. I think. Okay, very good. And we have Jeff from Norton. Go ahead, Jeff. Hi, um, I'm calling in regards to Highway 383 that runs from Norton to the state line. And my and the road is very narrow, and I've been. You meet a lot of wide loads, especially the windmills on it, and there's not a lot of room. And are they going to be redoing that in the near future? Good question. Thank you. I don't know that that transportation. particular project is on on the list, but I will tell you, it's you're not alone. There are many very narrow rural highways in the state. Representative Jennings will be on one this evening on his way home, um, 156 Highway leading into Garden City. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, within state government, we have a, a, a long list of pent-up needs within state government, and the state highway system is, is one of the biggest, and we can't do it all immediately. Um, with the new transportation plan, we'll begin to address that and hopefully start to get caught up, but many of those projects are going to have to wait for quite a while. And, and uh, unfortunately, many of those will be in rural Kansas. Yep, very good. Well, I've been given the, the notice that we can no longer accept calls for this evening. I appreciate all the calls that have come in. So please call in next week <laughs> if you can. Uh, we have about two minutes left, so um, uh, why don't we make sure we hit any issues that, we, that you wanted to bring up and we haven't hit yet. Uh, sure, go ahead. <clears throat> this year in the state of the state address, Governor Kelly talked about foster care and the crisis that we are in here in Kansas. And I happen to serve on the Children's and Seniors Committee. Mm -hmm. And uh, a couple weeks ago, I introduced a bill which is part of the uh, foster care kind of revitalization plan and uh, what that does it, it's a plan uh, that we partner with the federal government and we get a 50 50 match and how this works is we identify children and families th that need help that possibly their children could be foster care candidates and we provide these families with services up front, like mental health, alcohol, drug 
type counseling, uh, things of that nature. And the whole idea of this is to keep that family intact, keep it strong. And the other, uh, and so we'll be appropriating some money for this particular project and that is up in the uh, committee uh, for a vote on Monday and then it will be sent to the full house uh, for further work on it. Okay, very good. I'm going to warn you we have about 30 seconds left okay. so go ahead. A couple uh, items uh, in the Senate anyway. We uh, will be talking about uh, sp online sports betting. Oh, right. uh, the internet sales tax, and uh, I, I think that uh, the uh, expansion of Medicaid will be probably something that we deal with as well this session. Very good. Okay. All right. Um, sports betting, that's one thing I've had on my list that I was going to uh, bring up, but I didn't. Well, I think that's the end of our show. I want to thank everyone for watching the Kansas Legislature. Uh, my name is Mike Walker with the Docking Institute of Public Affairs. Uh, thank you very much.